All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, welcome to Creating Ripples Using Environmental Education. Um, my name is Megan Post, County Extension Agent here at the Washington County Office. I hope all of you are staying warm today. And if you're tuning in, that means you have electricity. So yes to that. Um, just some housekeeping. The chat will be blocked, but you can ask questions in the Q&A, and I will be monitoring them um, the whole time. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. <clears throat> Going to share my screen. All right, and to begin, I am a county extension agent in water quality. My job is soft funded through an EPA 319 grant that is actually uh, paid for by the Clean Water Act. Um, my overall goal in my position is non-point source pollution prevention through education and outreach. And so first I'd like to kind of talk about some successes and challenges that I experience here in Northwest Arkansas. And then, of course, I will introduce the main show, um, Mike and Rachel with Living Lands and Waters. <clears throat> so Arkansas deemed the natural state as a state of mountains, valleys, dense woodland, and fertile plains. I'd also like to recognize the Osage Nation and other indigenous tribes that lived and hunted here in the Northwest section. The Ozark Karst ecosystem is an underground wilderness of caves, springs, and aquifers that over the millennia have formed in the carbonate bedrock of the Ozark Highlands. So when you see water here in the winter time, it has that light turquoise hint, that's the calcium um, in the water. It makes it so beautiful. The poorest, the poorest nature of karst is how water travels so quickly underground and why protecting water quality is so important to this region specifically. Um, it's also all these beautiful pictures that I'm showing you is, is why people choose to emigrate to Northwest Arkansas. There's so much to love about it. In fact, over around 30 people move to Northwest Arkansas per day. From 2000 to 2010 alone, urban land use increased 72%. Northwest Arkansas continues to add about 30 people, urban and suburban residents per day, and it's to no surprise. So, here are some examples of why uh, our economy is so is booming. Um, cycling, Fayetteville was just deemed bike city by Union Cyclists International, the world governing body of cycling. We have more than a handful of schools. This list is not exhaustive here. So a lot of people move here to come to uh, college. And recreation, the state of Arkansas generates $9.7 billion annually from recreation alone. We have um, about 484 miles of trails and of course our beautiful Buffalo River flows freely um, unimpeded for 135 miles. It was actually the world's first national river. The um, arts and culture here estimate that we made about $131.2 million off of that in 2017. So it's a huge industry here. Um, our local food culture is amazing. Anything that you're craving, you can essentially drive downtown and, and get in any, any day of the week. And then Crystal Bridges, we have a world-renowned museum here, and it is actually free to the public, um, uh, thanks to the Walton Foundation. And then some people move here because um, our big three Fortune 500 companies are here in Northwest Arkansas, Walmart, Tyson Foods, and J.B. Hunt. So the pace of growth in this area places uh, increasing demand on development and infrastructure, thereby increasing impervious surfaces and altering land use. So the priority watersheds I work in are the Illinois River and Beaver Lake watersheds. Um, they have been deemed priority um, because what that means is the whole watershed is in threat of losing or has lost some of its designated uses from impairment or pollution. Examples of designated uses are drinking water, fishing, agriculture, and aquatic habitat. Non-point source pollution is a major culprit. Um, Non-point source pollution comes from a variety of different sources. It's not just one, one source, like point source pollution. Um, some examples of that are litter, bacteria, oils from cars, sediment, excess nutrients, herbicides, and pesticides. And remember that delicate karst topography that we have here, it makes non-point source pollution prevention that much more imperative that we take care of it. So, how do I do my job? <laughs> so my main goal is to um, educate non-point source pollution prevention. Um, in 2021, it looks a little bit different than what it would look like in 2019. Um, we offer free virtual watershed programming to um, schools that are located in the Illinois River and Beaver Lake watershed specifically. Um, what's great about this is we can reach a larger majority of the population this way. Um, so that's just one of the positives from all of it. 
And that right hand side picture, um, my colleague Jane created um, a chart that students actually have in their desks. And so they're able to chart um, where a water droplet goes throughout their watershed. So we try to make it as interactive as we can. <clears throat> this was a follow up from a watershed demonstration that I did with Arkansas Arts Academy. I'm working with sixth grade teacher Lavona Serna, and she is definitely a yes teacher. She's so wonderful to work with. And her students are helping us build a rain garden um, in front of their school. So they're going to be able to see that every day um, and lasting generations will too. My predecessor um, did a uh, hosted a successful virtual rain barrel workshop where participants were able to pick up their supplies and then a um, couple days later, they were able to tune in to a virtual uh, workshop. We also created um, some monofilament bin recycling stations, and these are monitored by volunteers. Volunteers are a huge um, aspect of the grant that I'm funded through, and so we try to get them involved as much as possible because obviously hands-on learning is the best way to learn. So this specific one on the bottom left-hand corner is um, monitored by a um, Boy Scout troop. We also have set up some booths um, uh, educating the public on the importance of picking up their pets waste. It might sound kind of minor, but um, in the grand scheme of things, watershed health wise, um, Fayetteville alone creates almost 7 billion pounds of pet waste in one year. Um, and that's a rough estimate, but uh, just think of all that pet waste going down drains and leading directly into um, our waterways here. We also offer landowner site visits in the region. So if you, um, the bottom left-hand picture, there's a cut bank happening. Um, that's pretty frequent um, in, in the city limits. Um, the more impervious surfaces you have, the more that this is an ever-present issue and growing. And so we kind of help landowners discuss best management practices they can do to take care of their properties. And then also some um, low impact developments that they can install, uh, rain gardens, bioswales, um, trying to soak in that storm water, that rain water as best as we can. My colleague, Jane Maginot is spearheading this project. It's absolutely incredible. Um, based off of Stacy Levy's work, uh, we put down some survey whiskers that show the flow of storm water um, with stickers as well. Um, we show the form of storm water through the drains and then directly through the creeks. And this is in downtown Springdale and you're able to view this. Um, currently, and I believe through the month of April. Um, we've just been embracing social media and use it to um, uh, promote our programming, like uh, my site visits, our education programming, um, try to get the word out there as best as we can. We also have a YouTube channel that um, we are able to upload educational material 24-7. Um, and then, you know, this picture is taken pre-COVID, but we also host community cleanups, and that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and so uh, our homeless population is pretty large here in Fayetteville specifically. Um, it generates a lot of waste that goes into our creeks. And so one thing we can do um, is post cleanups along our creeks. We actually have a, a cleanup happening in Spring Creek on March 20th as a follow up to this um, webinar. So I hope you join us. Registration is in the link on my Facebook event page. And to introduce uh, my friends, my fellow river rats, um, they are no greenhorns to cleanups. They work and live on a fleet of five barges. Um, Rachel and Mike spend their days on our nation's rivers, educating the masses on the protection, preservation, and restoration of the natural environment of the nation's major rivers and their watersheds. Their education programming is unlike any other, and I'm so excited for them to be here. So please welcome my friends, Rachel Loomis and Mike Coin logan Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, just want to give a shout out to Megan. Uh, uh, Megan was uh, actually a former crew member and one of the educators on our crew um, for, for a while. So uh, great to be here today and talk to you guys about Living Lands and Waters, our mission. Um, and also just uh, to start out, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history, um, how the organization was started, uh, our overall programming, and uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to talk about some of the challenges. We should go more in depth about our education program and, and some of the challenges we faced with uh, the pandemic. So our organization, Living Lands and Waters, was started by this guy right here. This is Chad, my friend and boss, Chad Prokraki. And Chad grew up right on the Mississippi River. Uh, literally, uh, his parents' house was 15 feet from the river. And it was his backyard. It was his playground. 
He fished on the river, uh, played on the river, and worked as a commercial shell diver or muscle diver in the summers uh, during high school and college with his older brother. And this is him and the gear he used to wear as a commercial shell diver. Uh, he'd wear this wetsuit uh, with a respirator. There'd be a little pump that run hoses uh, to give him oxygen as he crawled literally, uh, you know, miles and miles at the bottom of the Mississippi River uh, collecting mussel shells. And while they did this uh, in the summers, him and his brother would camp on islands up and down the Mississippi River and just growing up on the river, but also exploring the river um, and getting to places that a lot of people don't see, he, he realized just how much trash was in the watershed and in the valley of the river, uh, in the, in, on the shorelines, on these islands. Um, and he wanted to do something about it. So at a very young age, Chad started to make phone calls to officials in the state government asking for funding uh, but they all turned him down and for a variety of different reasons, you know, some said uh, you're crazy, you're not going to make a difference, you can take trash out of the river, it's going to get flooded or dumped back in. Others said it sounded like a good idea, but they didn't have the funding uh, for that, you know, to take, you know, make it a huge project. Um, and then others, he also felt just they were reluctant because he was so young. When he uh, initially approached him, he was in high school to take on such a huge ta task as cleaning up the Mississippi River. But he, uh, you know, he didn't let this idea go. He kept brainstorming ways to get this off the ground and running. And it was in college. Uh, one day, his friends had a NASCAR race on TV. And he noticed uh, from the race that the cars were decorated by different logos or stickers. And sponsors had paid to put those logos on there. And he thought if companies are willing to sponsor someone to drive a NASCAR, maybe companies would be willing to sponsor someone to clean up the river and he took the idea, ran with it, and started to contact and reach out to a variety of different businesses. And he saw he ran into a lot of the same obstacles he did with the with the state. And that is a lot of people turned him down for a variety of different reasons. But finally, he got one sponsorship, one grant for eighty four hundred dollars, and it was enough money for him to go out in his own John boat. Uh, this was in the early days. That first year it was just this one guy, one boat, picking up trash. And people would see him and ask him what he was doing, you know, and he would tell them and, you know, some people question, you know, why are you doing that? Or, uh, you know, they'd also, you know, think this kid's, I give this kid a month before he gives up. But Chad is just relentless, uh, has a passion and energy that's very contagious and didn't give up, just kept doing it every day. And other people though thought this was awesome. And uh, some of these people contact the local newspaper, a local newspaper came out, did a story on Chad and ran on the front page of the paper uh, and brought a lot of attention locally to his mission. And it also brought positive PR to the company that gave him the money to do this. But also through the Associated Press, major news networks got wind of this story, started to cover Chad's story of this young kid cleaning up this national treasure, the Mississippi River, which then kind of propelled him, gave him more momentum kind of legitimized what he was doing, brought national attention to this problem. And with that, he kind of used it as springboard to gain even more sponsorship over the years. But, you know, those first years, uh, you know, it was just him in one boat. In fact, at one point he was even staged, this is him staging trash that he collected in uh, his parents' backyard. They weren't really uh, keen to that idea. And that was one of the, you know, early uh, dilemmas he faced, just constantly trying to get this stuff properly to a recycling center, a landfill, a scrap yard. It took so much time. And uh, I'm going to show you here what solution he came up with to, to address this particular problem. So fast forward today, uh, you know, living lands and water, there's uh, 10 of us full-time crew members. Uh, our fleet and equipment has drastically changed and we rely heavily on volunteers. Uh, these are, this is from a cleanup and you can see one of our sponsors here, John Deere employees helping out a big cleanup and the stuff that we collect. And we then, most of the stuff that we get, we use, uh, we now have a fleet of six of these John boats. Uh, they're all around 30 feet long. They can carry easily two to 3000 pounds worth of weight. We then take this trash back to now we have a fleet of barges and heavy equipment. Um, and we're, we're like, Chad says, we're like one of the, the, the only industrial size or strength cleanup organization 
that he knows of in the United States, at least at, at this level. So we have two tow boats. Uh, we have a house that also serves as a floating classroom, which Rachel will touch more on here shortly, uh, that we live on as a crew on and off about seven months out of the year. Uh, we have heavy uh, equipment to allow us to get even bigger things. For example, this excavator that allows us to get even sunken boats, uh, cars, or items that you know we just can't get with human muscle power. Uh, this allows us to get things that we couldn't get in the past. It also allows us to move and sort and offload stuff uh, that we have collected. We uh, here's a combine that we pulled out with. Uh, we also have this crane um, that we pulled out one time out of the river. The majority of the stuff that we find, though, is plastics, in particular, single use plastics. Um, but the stuff that we collect, all the tires, all the scrap metal, that stuff gets recycled. And we even have events. And if you can kind of see in the background of this, uh, this photo, uh, there's volunteers and we're sorting through the recyclable plastics. So we try to recycle as much of the stuff that we can that we collect. But this is what we're dealing with. This is how bad, and um, Megan talked and touched upon, uh, you know, dealing with non-point source pollution. And obviously the biggest one that we deal with uh, is, is trash, in particular plastics, uh, styrofoam and other form of plastic or single use plastics that don't go away and are persistent out in our waterways and our watersheds and, and really have a negative impact for both the waterways uh, the, the water that we get as a drinking water source, but also for, uh, you know, the, the, the animals and, and uh, creatures that live in those, in those waterways. The, another example, just to give you an idea, these are all photos that we have taken. This is not taken from the internet of sites that we have worked. This is all floating trash from a location, a backwater of the Mississippi River here you see. But, the, you know, as big as this problem may seem, um, you know, it can almost be paralyzing, can be almost feel hopeless. Uh, but I, I, I hope from this whole session today that it's encouraging. And like I said, it inspires you. Um, and part of that is definitely education. And I think one of the biggest, you know, tools, education is education through action and getting people involved and volunteers involved to wake them up to this problem. And this is a photo taken from about 10 years ago in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, you can see all the floating trash in the water in the background. The city here is picking up debris off the land, off the levee there, um, but they can't get to a lot of that trash in the background. But over the last 10 years, through one of my favorite programs, our alternative spring break program, where we trick college students, and no, we just kidding, but we get kids to come out from schools all across the country to help us work in different locations. But for 10 years, we work with college students, local volunteers, local high school students in this area, and our crew in this site that used to look like that now looks like this. So it just speaks to, you know, people coming together, working together and not being paralyzed by a problem, but going out and trying to do something about it and start small, but all those little small actions add up. So with the pandemic, like I said, we rely heavily on volunteers uh, to really boost our numbers uh, in, 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 in maximize the amount of trash that we get every year. But 2020 obviously posed a lot of challenges when it came to that. Uh, we did a lot less cleanups with volunteers, a lot smaller numbers to be safe. We had to cancel a lot of bigger events with volunteers. Uh, we still did a lot of cleanups as a crew, uh, but last year we still removed you know, a good amount of trash, 172,000 pounds. But on a typical year, we're removing over 500,000 pounds of trash from rivers in the United States every year. Uh, just our overall, since the organization was started by this one guy, Chad, uh, we've, we've removed close to 11 million pounds of trash from over 24 rivers in the United States. Like I said, we worked with a ton of great volunteers, uh, 117,000 volunteers. That floating classroom that we also live on, we've uh, had over 11,000 students for hands-on river education. And then we also have other programs as well. One of the programs that we're working on right now is our Million Trees project. Um, after this year will be over 1.5 million trees that we've distributed to be planted or planted ourselves from this particular program. So 
besides river cleanups, we also do some other things. Like I said, our Million Trees Project, this is a picture of our nursery uh, that we get some of the trees that we distribute for free to uh, just parks, to local community members, to our employee sponsors. And then another thing that we're involved is, in, is uh, invasive species removal and also uh, some restoration projects. This is from our uh, IED restoration project where we went in, moved a lot of invasives and then planted native prairies uh, prairie grasses and forbs. Um, and this is a shot taken from that particular uh, photo, uh, that area down the IED clover leaf. That's about 17 acres that we've done some restoration. And then we have our GMRC and uh, AARM Adopt a River Mile program. So uh, it's like handing over, you know, we come in and we do, you know, these places where we get a lot and tons and tons of stuff. Uh, get kind of inspire uh, the local community to then kind of maintain it through these other programs, hand the keys over to them, uh, just kind of like similar to the adopt a uh, highway program. Uh, local community members will, you know, take a stretch of river that they promise to clean up twice a year to maintain it to keep it clean. Um, and then our, our GMRC program are very similar just they do one big cleanup, we provide them the materials uh, to do that stuff. But to, you know, once we've worked a long time in a community, hopefully we can turn it over to those local community members to keep it clean. So that's uh, that's my part of the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to, to Rachel and she's going to talk. Oh, sorry. I'm just kidding. I want to share with you guys another important part of this is, uh, you know, the fun part is one man's trash is another man's treasure. And here are some unique items uh, that we found over the years. On the left, there's a, a, a volunteer who's found a message in a bottle. Chad. Uh, has one of the largest message in a bottle collections in the world. Here's a volunteer with a prosthetic leg that was found, kind of sharing you some unique things from cleanups. An electric guitar, this was actually found in Memphis. I found this guitar in Memphis, Tennessee, of all places. Uh, uh, there's Megan, you might recognize Megan there. These are uh, clown shoes that we found. Uh, uh, I was for the longest time the only crew member to find a, a clown shoe and uh, Megan then found uh, one uh, years after that. So there's been two clown shoes found over the years at cleanups. And then this is, I always like to share this. We talk about one of the most unique things ever found at a cleanup. Uh, this is actually a mortar shell from the Civil War found in Paducah, Kentucky by a volunteer, but an 1863 Confederate mortar shell. So you never know what you're going to find out there. You know, a lot of it's the same old saying, but sometimes you find some really cool, unique things. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rachel now, uh, and she's going to touch more on our education program and challenge you this thing. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining, and thanks for uh, just staying tuned with all that information that Mike gave away for Living Lands and Waters. As you guys can see, we are a really fun crew. We're excited to get out in the river or uh, planting trees or, of course, educating students. And as Mike touched on, 2020 was definitely a year for the records. Uh, all of our operations changed. We obviously had to adapt. We were so excited to get on the river um, and educate students, get out there with all these volunteers. Of course, the floating barge, the floating classroom, I should say, is one of our biggest and most proud things that we can kind of invite people to come out to. So this is kind of an outdated version of the classroom, but it's truly one of a kind of experience. We're teaching these kids about water quality, how to become stewards for the future. And we're really getting out there, not only just talking about it and doing lessons, but as you can see from this image here, these students are getting out on the river with us and having a lasting impact of their daily field trip that they took with us that day. They're experiencing one of, one of a kind experiences. They're getting in our 30 foot John boats and just taking a, uh, you know, a ride on the river, um, seeing views maybe that some of them have never seen before. Of course, we're, we're in the classroom too, doing really great work. We're collecting macro invertebrates. We're doing water quality testing. 
And even in the off season, when we're not on the river, we're reaching out to the students in these communities to go into their schools to do some type of same work with lessons, um, just creating some inspiration. And so it, it was a, a crazy year to be able to say that, hey, we were actually in Memphis, Tennessee prior to COVID. We were on a rainy day. We were doing some investigation work of the, the materials that we were finding along the river um, on the Mississippi River, mostly plastic. As you can see from this image here, these students are talking about what they found, what, what items they're finding most common. And this was a hundred students in a, in a classroom together, right? And then it kind of shifted towards this, sadly. Um, but as you all know, us as educators, whether we're formal, non-formal, uh, parents to, to kids in everyday lives, we're all teaching our youth and each other about how we are going to adapt. So we took some time and just started focusing on our river cleanup operations, as well as our other projects, as Mike touched on, our tree nursery, um, really making sure people can get out in their own communities to do some work. But we got our hands dirty and we continue to clean up thousands of pounds of garbage, um, including plastic straws, balloons, plastic bottles, tires, uh, docks from people's, uh, you know, uh, piers floating away, styrofoam, so many items. And that is truly the one of a kind experience that we wanted to start bringing back to these students all over the country, even through a pandemic. And so with that, environmental education kind of shifted for us, as I'm sure it did for um, some of you that might be educators that are joining with us today. Uh, this meme kind of resurfaced on my social media a few years ago, and I thought today would be a really appropriate way to really just shift into that technological uh, phase that we went through all this year. And even though as much as we want to admit us as educators are getting out there with our students, maybe being some tree huggers, getting our hands dirty, this last image is what we were all about this past year. Maybe a little bit more enthusiastic than this image shows, but we were in front of our computers a lot. Not only lesson planning, but we were connecting with our students through a virtual screen as well. So how exactly did we do that? How did we connect with these students? How did we give them this experience through a screen? Well, we started off by just asking in, a, in the beginning of our sessions and in, in the beginning of our virtual sessions, how do you connect with nature? That's the whole idea of our programs is to get these students connected with the natural environment in various ways. And so we asked that simple question and it was through uh, pollev.com. Maybe some of you have used this in your resources little, little bucket, but we started asking that question where these students could, could submit their answers on uh, pollev.com. And it kind of created a beautiful word cloud. Um, sometimes we would have them enter in a sentence. Sometimes it would just be a phrase. Some of these students had such beautiful answers. And um, like this student says, the natural environment, the nature, it's providing us food and oxygen. Um, this student connected it to her father, right? So nature is something that we're connecting to with people as well. I love the fresh air and how earth can change and grow beautiful things. Nature provides a home for everybody. That is totally something that we can relate to while we're talking about water and specifically our rivers in the country. And just some other little quick answers such as relaxation, how much you can explore, the sounds that nature brings, and of course, how beautiful it can be. Right off from the bat, we're assessing these students and seeing how they connect with nature so we can make that a more personable and one-on-one -on -one connection with them, even through a computer screen. So as you can imagine, virtual education, it was a challenge. There were definitely some times where things didn't go as planned. I was doing a live live webinar on Facebook Live and our audio cut out. Um, and so that didn't go as planned, but it's all about trying, right? Uh, we get up and close and personal in these screens to make sure we can hear the students and see what they're saying or see what they're, they're motioning to us. 
We were on the barge giving virtual sessions exactly from there. We're not only meeting with maybe 10 students, but at one point we were meeting with 60 to 70 students in one single session. We made some really awesome videos to showcase to people this one specifically on water quality testing. I highly recommend for you to go check it out on our YouTube channel. Hopefully you get a little bit of a laugh as you can see uh, Mike's muscles are a good start to that. So water quality testing. And again, as uh, Mike had showcased our barge, this is a truly a one of a kind of experience. This is where our crew is waking up every day for six to nine months out of the year to say, hey, this is our home, this is our job. So of course we were wanting to showcase just the unique, uh, the unique setting that we're in, but also expose them to career exploration. We did more virtual education sessions. We did some water quality testing and we even brought in a model for our watershed models to really showcase non-point and point sources of pollution. Chad Pergracki, the, the gentleman himself who started this all, he was featured in our workshops as well, whether that was a pre-recorded video or he just happened to be you know, on the barge and came live in the session. But what really what we're trying to do is connect them to what we're typically seeing in our everyday lives on the river. So yes, this is a real image. This is something that we're showcasing to them when the students are coming aboard our, our fleet of barges. Um, so really just showcasing to them this that this, this is real. This is happening in our communities and our backyards. Maybe something a little bit more connecting to as when we go to these parks or our school grounds, we might see cigarette butts. So again, making that connection and just showcasing to them that we're out there, we're doing this. We're not just talking about it, but we're being about it too. So filling up these 30 foot John boats with all sorts of plastic, tires, styrofoam, refrigerators, couches, you name it, we probably picked it up. And that was really a special point in our sessions that we got to showcase to these students. And so to really wrap it up, the virtual sessions were to say, hey, let's connect you to the natural environment, but also reflect on your everyday life and how can you start making a difference today? So we were asking this question to students of all kinds, whether they were fourth graders, uh, high school students, middle schoolers, and even some college students as well. Because when we think about the reality of our world, it's not just happening in third world countries that pollution, uh, climate change, plastic pollution specifically, it's happening in our backyards, in our communities, and specifically in America's rivers. So what did we do in 2020? We adapted, we had fun, uh, we had some challenges of course, but in the end we were able to still educate over 6,000 students, which is pretty remarkable, knowing that virtual education, we didn't know what to offer right at front, but we knew we had to be a resource for these formal teachers, for these parents all throughout the country and maybe even the world, um, and just showcase to them that we are here for them as a resource and that we're willing to give them an experience if they so choose. And so what did our feedback look like from these sessions from last year in the in the midst of a pandemic? As you can see here, teacher feedback was phenomenal. Of course, just to you know, be a re reality check too. Yeah, of course, there were some things we can improve on, such as the tech technological side. Um, maybe have a few more few more minutes to have the questions answered uh, for the students. You know, you know, sixty students in one. In one session, that's a lot to handle, right? So we were adapting, but overall we got some amazing teacher feedback as well. As you can see here, some teachers said that it was meaningful, that the students are rethinking some of their choices. We're connecting them to something physical that, you know, we're not just talking about it, we're showcasing it as well. And that we're making an inspiring change for students to go out in their communities take action and pick up some garbage right in their backyards. Student feedback was pretty great as well, so we can't complain about that. We showcased to them that the knowledge, um, the power that they have to do something different in their life, 
in their everyday life, they have the power to do exactly that. So as you can see, rivers are important because they are a part of our everyday life. That is so true. Every little thing we can do can impact the Mississippi River and the rivers connected. So we're not only just educating them about how big and beautiful and powerful the Mississippi is, but again, reiterating saying we're connecting you to your community, whether you're in uh, Maryland, Washington, down south in Kentucky, and really making us all just connected as humans. Um, it's a direct impact for our daily lives. Want to learn more about the rivers and river cleanup. So inspiring people, having a better understanding. And so that was really the drive of our virtual sessions. And I think we did great. And so did we connect them to the natural environment? Did we have some attitude changes? Was more knowledge given to them? Um, and were they, you know, have more knowledge by the end of our sessions? Career exposure, excuse me, um, plastic pollution and non-point point sources of pollution and future stewards? Absolutely. And we couldn't be more proud of that. And so what's ahead for 2021? Yeah, we're still kind of in this pandemic thing. There's still a lot of unknown territory that is on the horizon. And so as much as we want to say we're moving on from 2020, the truth is, is that we're still going to do some virtual education. So we are still providing virtual education to formal teachers if they so choose to sign up for their science class, for their human impacts class, or um, you know, clubs such as a climate club that they host after school, where we are really featuring just how unique this operation is. So that includes the barge tours, river views, water quality education, connecting students to everyday lives, right? So really making that one-on-one -on -one connection. We're also launching a virtual community exploration and challenge program. This will be a, a 40 student capacity program where we have the students apply. If they get accepted, they will be working with us for eight months. So starting in April, going to November, and they will be provided challenges, lessons, and even materials for them to make it as accessible to any student um, that is accepted into the program as possible. So, you know, we might not have as many numbers, but making sure we're making that everlasting connection with people and really connecting to them to nature, no matter how nature is defined by them, um, and just being a resource for those 40 students. And as much as possible, having socially distant outdoors events, such as Monarch tagging, we want to implement that into our I-80 site, continuing the career exploration, nature hikes at our local forest preserve, and really enc encourage these students, whether they are youth or adults, to get out there and do some cleanup, whether that's in their community or along the river, shed, uh, river watershed or uh, a storm drain investigation. And so from this presentation, we couldn't thank you all enough for joining us. We hope it left you lit a little bit more inspired for this year and just how many people are doing this type of important work. Um, we're all trying to make this world a little bit of a better place. And it really all starts with just us as individuals. It can grow from there amongst our uh, families, our, our group of friends, you know, our students, our coworkers. And so I like to always end on a little quote like this because I really do think um, committed citizens are really going to be the answer for so many of the things that are being brought up with our natural environment today. And so feel free to check us out on all social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Um, and so feel free to go to our website to reach out to us. We would love to hear from you from this webinar. If you're interested in getting some virtual education set up, we would love to give your students a tour. Um, if you're interested in signing up for this app, uh, for this virtual uh, program that is going to be launched in 2021, we would love that too. And any questions that aren't answered today. And so thank you again to the University of Arkansas Extension for featuring us in this wonderful webinar. And uh, we'll uh, kind of open it up to questions from there. So thanks so much, everybody.
Thank you, Rachel and Mike. That was amazing. And I am inspired. This story never gets old. Um, so we have a lot of questions here. Um, I'll start. Uh, Stephanie asks, particularly during the pandemic, what can at-risk volunteers do besides contribute funds through Amazon Smile or direct donations? Go ahead. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things we can do is just we can all like reevaluate uh, basic materials we buy every day uh, and, and in particular our, our reduction of plastics and be conscious of that stuff. Uh, we have this discussion all the time. I mean, if I didn't work where I did or wasn't involved in what we do and see firsthand just how much it'd be something that I honestly probably wouldn't think about or be obviously as aware of. Uh, and that is just the amount of single use plastics we use on a day to day basis from, you know, 15 years ago, I wouldn't think twice about getting, you know, a beverage that comes in a plastic bottle or buy a bottle of water. But now it's like, I just refuse to. Um, and, and just, you know, not using as simple as like not using straws and because there's just, there's just way too much of it that we use for a short amount of time. And that's the majority of stuff that we see. It doesn't go away. And even if you do properly throw away, it's going to be sitting in a landfill for years. So there's that. And there's also just, you know, cleaning up this, what you can in your own community, you know, doing these small cleanups, even taking a small grocery bag, if you go on a walk to get outside and, and clean up the trash that you see in your community, because the majority of it, 80% of the stuff that we collect, it starts out as just litter in your local community, your local neighborhood, and then washes in through storm drains, blows into a creek or a stream, and then ends up where we're at. So that's, you know, just on an individual basis, you know, reduction of uh, our plastic, you know, single use plastics that we use and, and, and just clean up your, your, your little spot, your little world. And they can volunteer um, with you guys in the future by accessing your um, volunteer tab on the website. Is that correct? Yes. Yep, yeah. absolutely. And again, this, this year is going to be a little different. We're not really sure if, at this point if we're going to be able to work with volunteers on the scale that we typically do. Um, but just to echo kind of what Mike said, um, you know, I, I'm from Wisconsin. This is a, you know, a, a quite an adventure to be on for this job. And, uh, you know, it's really all about making a difference in your world. So, you know, we're going to be out on the Ohio River this, this summer and this fall. So if you can't get out there, make a difference in your community, start small and then grow from there. Great. Wonderful. Um, I had um, somebody ask if you can put the last slide back up so they can take a picture of the contact information. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> um, H. Fink says, curious to know who drives the tugboat. So <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, so we have, a, we have a list of captains that we recruit to come out in, in uh, move our towboat. We have, you know, some captains we like to work with more than others we just have a better relationship we go to them first and then if that doesn't work we we get other captains to move us but we also uh to save money uh we hitch rides our fleet will get attached to other barge fleets to move us to locations to save on fuel expenses and fuel cost uh a little bit more carbon footprint friendly as well, thinking about it that way. And um, because our, our work is so unique, we are so fortunate for the, you know, maritime industry to be able to help us out with things like that. Um, because we, we do have such a small crew of just 10 full-time employees here. So uh, we're, we're trying to be the best deckhands we can be out there, but we're learning as much as anybody else every day. So we're very grateful for the people that are willing to help us out on the river, so. Awesome, uh, where is the I-80 Prairie Restoration Project? Uh, that is on the border of Illinois and uh, Iowa, uh, just at the I-80 bridge that crosses the Mississippi River. Uh, just on the Illinois side. Yep, yep and uh, we're continuously working. Um, we just installed the bee habitat at that site this past summer. Um, you know, we're, we're learning more and more about the prairie, prairie flowers that are out there and just how best to manage them. And so we do invasive species removal events at that I-80 site as well. And so um, it's a really unique project and and Chad himself has said, you know, everybody loves the river cleanup, 
project that we have going on, but Illinois, it's the prairie state. And so to see another prairie implemented into our wonderful, wonderful world is just another beautiful thing. So if you're ever driving past or you're in the area, feel free to check it out and just kind of kind of see what it, what it all has. So it's a very beautiful site. It is. Um, Brian Ellis asks, what is one of your favorite and most effective lessons? Oh, that's a great question. So we actually, with this, this year of creating more lessons to hand out to parents um, while they're at home with their students or the teachers while they can, you know, be with their students, whether that's virtually or in person, we actually just created a waste audit lesson this year. And if you're interested in receiving that, Brian, or anybody else, feel free to reach out to me um, at my email. And I would love to pass that on. The waste audit is just, uh, you know, a lesson to say to these students, whether they're at home, at school, at their sports practice, um, at 4-H clubs or Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. A waste audit is just to really log everything that you're throwing away in a week, um, maybe a few days if you don't have a week or a month if you really want to get into it. Um, but it's just showcasing to the students or to the adults, right, no matter who the student is, of what you're throwing away in your everyday life. Um, we've done this with students throughout this past fall, and it, it took us by surprise to to just see how involved they were in the waste audit lesson. Um, everything from chip wrappers to plastic bottles, but even food waste as well. Um, we, we don't consider maybe food waste as much as we should. That's, you know, going into our landfills and contributing to greenhouse gases. And uh, so the waste audit, I think would would be my favorite one. Um, runner up is definitely just getting out on the river and doing cleanups with them, like side by side with the students. So, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would I would say the same. I think we have a. I like a lot of our lessons. Uh, I definitely think the most one of the most impactful is when you you uh, have the kids do a cleanup and then that post discussion that uh, entails a lot of the waste audit questions. Yeah. Um, but you can just see the light bulbs. Yeah clicking like you can really yeah. see firsthand and Megan you you can account for that you've been a part of those lessons as well obviously. yeah the direct connection and hands-on learning is everything you know it's how humans learn <laughs> so it just makes sense it's awesome um Alyssa asks if you have any projects going on in Arkansas and particularly the Ozarks but before you answer mm -hmm. um <laughs> I will also uh Put in a shameless plug that uh, at the extension we are incorporating litter pickup into the extension walk across northwest arkansas spring walking campaign so if you if you guys can check out our extension facebook pages for more information on that and then also another thing to add um, uh, reed green says that memphis uh, those pictures you were showing um, look like Forsh Creek bottoms in Little Rock. So before you say no, I will say we do have garbage here and there is a lot of it. <laughs> Maybe not in Northwest Arkansas, but in the Little Rock area. Um, do you guys plan on coming to Arkansas anytime soon? Uh, not not that I know, but that always, you know as well as I do, Megan, that can always change. Uh, so yeah, I, for, as of right now, no, but uh, like I said, that, does, that doesn't rule it out at all. Yeah. We would love to come. We yeah. would love to come. So yes. do a little scouting for us <laughs> and uh, pull us in and we'll, we'll have a word with Chad. You got it. I'll be, I'll be sure to do that. You guys send me some gnarly pictures to my email and then I can back it up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Amy asks, who are your major sponsors, mostly corporate or do you continue to operate from grant funds, government grants? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and just to kind of throw it out there, our annual budget is about two to three million dollars each and every year. So our sponsors play a huge role within our operations. And again, we couldn't be more grateful for that. Um, and that really all started with Chad. Uh, uh, you know, he he started um, by just opening up a old school telephone book and we have worked with local sponsors and we still do today. And we've also worked with, uh, you know, countrywide sponsors as well. And so 
Um, on a local level, John Deere is a huge one. They're right here in the Quad Cities, East Moline area. So John Deere has been a sponsor of ours for how long, Mike? Uh, I want to say like seven years or so. Um, but yeah, I, I just, you know, in this individual uh, sponsorship to donations, uh, yep. it's all important in yeah. uh, some grant, some grant funding. Yeah. Majority is from corporate sponsors. Another great thing is, uh, is in, you know, not only the money that the uh, engaging their employees in a lot of events too. And, and, and also the educating of, you know, not only, Oh, here's, here's a check. Thanks. But, you know, hopefully getting them to change their attitudes and mindsets when it comes to, to, to different issues facing the river as well. Yeah. And so we actually have a page on our, on our website. Um, it's, you know, probably in the general tab. If you want to look at our sponsors, you're more than welcome to do that. But yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful thing to be able to, you know, be very grateful to receive funds from them. But in return, we're not only saying, like Mike said, uh, thank you for the funds, but we're saying, hey, now you get to see where these funds go to. Let's get out on the river and do some cleanups with us. Uh, invasive species removal events, uh, tree planting. So whatever, you know, whatever we can collaborate on with these sponsors, we we love that. And so that's a really awesome part of our job as well. One of the, Absolutely. One of the cooler things that we started doing recently and, um, before the pandemic is uh, through Cliff Bar, they have a, a organization called In Good Company where they recruit other employees from companies and they come out not only for a day, but for a week. Uh, so you have these same employees for a week. It's kind of like an adult spring break, which is great because <laughs> yeah. then you get to hang out with the people afterwards uh, and you really just build these strong relationships. And after a week, you've really like, you've converted people. They, they understand, you know, they, yeah. they understand the problem. They, they get it. And, uh, you know, they bring those attitudes back to the places they work. And I think that's really, really powerful and awesome. And it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. It is so powerful. Yeah. Um, Alice asks, do you have to obtain permits from government, city, county, state, federal to engage in cleanups? No, you know, uh, in some instances, but really it's, you know, everybody's pretty receptive. You know, we've mm -hmm. uh, said, you know, we, we do have to, you know, get permits to park places, yeah. Yeah. Uh, our barges. <laughs> that's the biggest thing, you know, is it okay if we park our big fleet yeah. in front of your city? Our We're, big old garbage barges yeah, right, on yeah. your city front. <laughs> yeah, that's always a lot of fun to try to work with. But, uh, but everybody's for the most part, uh, pretty receptive yeah. uh, to what our mission is and what we're doing. I mean, the, you know, there's uh, and there's towns like Ripley where they are go out of their way to like little small towns that they go out of their way to help you. And the bar that's on the river is bringing you beers after a cleanup. You know, like, <laughs> they're the best towns. Yeah. <laughs> Mark those as ones to go back to. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, H. Fink asks, with the volume of recyclables that you collect, where do you take your plastics, tires, etc.? Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, after 22 years of having this operation, it's it's getting better and better. And um, so we actually have a pretty good system. So after we're done cleaning up all that garbage, we throw everything onto our barge where we sort it. That's why we have three to four different garbage barges. As much as the garbage is, you know, garbage, we try to make it as neat and tidy as we possibly can. Um, so that scrap, uh, you know, when the time is right, we get it to a scrap yard and we actually get money in exchange for that. And that goes right back into our budget. It might not, might not be too much, but you all know non for profits will take anything that we can say. Um, so that's our metal scrap, which we find out on the rivers a lot. Our tires, we actually partner with Bridgestone. They take our tires at the end of the year off of our hands for free, bring it back to their facilities where um, they then recycle the, the tires from the rivers into um, maybe like sidewalk surfaces or track fields, for example. So that's a really great part of the program as well. Um, styrofoam. The styrofoam is the, the one thing that we, we don't recycle. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's why, you know, you try to educate people on just completely avoid it. Yeah. Uh, and then and then the plastic. So plastic is the big one, right? So we are finding that the most out of anything um, probably within the last decade or so. And so we put all that stuff as 
you know, the little stuff in bags uh, and then bigger stuff, we kind of just separated out to see if we can try to recycle that as well. But we also actually host recycle like a rock star events where we bring on uh, mostly our sponsors and we dump all the garbage that are in these bags back out. Uh, they sift through them and kind of separate them from what can be recycled versus what unfortunately has to go to the landfill. So, you know, by the time by the time this garbage is getting to the facility it needs to, it's probably been touched by uh, volunteers, our crew members, uh, sponsors, probably, gosh, I don't know, five to 10 times. And so uh, with those plastics, uh, again, landfill or the recycling facility. And as an un unfortunate as it is to go into the landfill, it's better to be there managed by people than sitting in our rivers. So, and we absolutely those recycling events, we partner with uh, different recycling facilities. Yeah. Like we've had events even with Republic Services where they'll bring in, uh, you know, trucks that are designated to put the recycling in and then other trucks that just take the trash. Yeah. Uh, but it's all about making partnerships with, you know, those local, wherever we're doing those events, those yeah. local recycling yeah. waste facilities. Awesome. Alyssa says, um, I lived a block from the Mississippi River growing up and it was very dirty, which leads me to a question. Do you feel like the places you work at stay clean or does it revert back to how it was when you found it? Go ahead, Nines. Uh, no, it's, it's definitely a lot cleaner. I mean, uh, stuff goes back in there and that's that's the importance too of the adopt the river mile program and the great mississippi river cleanup uh we we've got you know we're not going back you know like places that we worked in the past year let's say for example like the ohio river uh we have to scout you know we we scout before we do big cleanups with 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 like big groups of people so a perfect example of that it when you first get to places that are really bad, it's like, Scott, there's, you don't need to scout, it's everywhere. But then it gets to the point where like, okay, we've got to like, we don't want to actually waste their time looking for it. We've got to go out and pre-scout these places. So it becomes harder and harder every year. And then it's a matter of just like, then giving these communities the power and, you know, inspiring them to, the, you know, take it on and just maintain it and keep it clean. Yeah. Um, not only through these, you know, Adopt River Mile program, but yeah. also the, the education programs and, and teaching the kids in that community how to be proactive reducing plastics keeping their neighborhoods clean because all this stuff ends up in the waterway so um yeah there's stuff that, that you know it still gets stuff in there but not on the same level that it was when we first got there yeah and a, a great example of that is memphis tennessee so we've been going back there during the month of march for that alternative spring break program mike touched on um and that's been 10 years and so i would say over the last 10 years there's definitely been an improvement but of course um garbage is still showing up um but it's it's it takes work and it takes consistent work right um and so and you know the crazy thing is too when we work on the ohio river this garbage may have been sitting there for 10 15 years already so um thinking about our history of how we treated rivers uh you know decades and decades ago you know these these tires might have been sitting there for quite some time and so we're making an impact in any way we possibly can and if that means we need to come back in a year we're we're more than happy to do it yeah, yeah. The tough, the, t the hard part is scheduling, you know, uh, the, you know, I think the biggest factor is the education component, the, the powerful impact when kids come out to the barge, you can just, you know, they can see these, this is for real, this is a real problem. You know, the barges are not only convenient for us to store stuff, but they're, uh, it, it, it's like, it creates so much awareness. Wow. That all came from the river. That all came from this location. And that's really powerful. Yeah. And then you, you can, you, you then, you know, educate students about how this got there, what they can do. And that's a really important key. That's the next step. And sometimes that's difficult to, you know, a city like Memphis, there's so many people to reach and, uh, you know, trying to coordinate, you know, college students, but also bring high school students and do more educational workshops and maintain the rest of our schedule. It's just, it's a lot, but it all adds up. And I think that's really the, the next key to, to keep those places really clean is the education component, obviously. I agree, it's so important. Um, I also want to add the booms that, you know, Chad worked with the city for over eight years to install. He persistently 
went and talked with the city and um, finally got some trash booms installed on Lake McKellar, which were so desperately needed. So it's not just you guys are picking up trash, but it's like your guys are getting involved and um, actually trying to fix the problem, not only through education, but also trying to, you know, catch all that stuff before it gets into Lake McKellar, which is incredible. Yeah, some of the, a little bit of the, not too much, but sometimes some local politics like putting in booms and maintaining. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a question about insurance and safety. So can you guys elaborate a little bit um, on your training that you do as a crew um, once a year, twice a year, and then also um, just talk about uh, the waivers that kids have to sign and um, how you handle uh, your safety. Because obviously that's number one. There's a lot of things that can go wrong every single day. So um, if you guys can touch base on that, and I think that will be our last question. Great. Yeah. Uh, I'll kind of start off. You can, you can add in, um, but no matter whether we're here in the quad cities um, at the shop working on mechanical stuff or working with volunteers on tree wrapping, which sounds so simple. And especially of course, working out on the barge, whether it's just with our crew or students, volunteers or sponsors, as Megan said, safety is our number one. Um, how do we go about that in our every everyday operations? Well, you know, we actually send out texts. Uh, we have, you know, a safety coordinator on our crew that sends out texts that really beginning of the day makes us really think about what we're doing, how we can prevent different situations from, you know, going, going bad. Um, but talking specifically about the barge, we have a safety meeting in our galley kitchen every single morning, and that can last five minutes, it can last 15 minutes or even 30 minutes. And so we're being as thorough as possible. Um, we are required to wear a safety vest at all times. Uh, we're making sure that, you know, there's no tripping hazards. Every small detail is really important for us. And so when kids or students or um, even adults come out, we do require everybody to um, make sure that they are physically capable of doing hands-on work such as river cleanup or invasive species removal, because it is hard work, right? And so we just wanna make sure people are able to do that. And so uh, we, we have waivers that everybody signs and um, those are just a small few things, but really important things that we're doing in our everyday operations. Yeah, just, uh, you know, with bigger uh, cleanups, doing the safety talks uh, with, with those groups before we do a cleanup, but then also being, persistent in, in reminding these volunteers throughout the cleanup what to look for. Yeah. Um, but it's really cool, you know, someone has been here for a while just to see the evolution of how, you know, how I, I think our safety has improved. You know, you see mm -hmm. certain situations uh, pop up and just trying to be, you know, not get complacent. That's the biggest thing is, yeah. uh, you know, everything's pretty, you can, you, it's just up to you, right? How safe that is, you know, yourself in those situations or, Calling people out too uh, yeah, no. amongst our crew members, you know, like as much as everybody probably is like, ah, oh, dang, you know, it, yeah. it just helps us all, just kind of keeps us all on our toes. Like, like Mike said, we we can't get complacent out here, um, whether that's just driving a John boat by yourself or filled up with 15 students or 10 adults, you know, um, it, it's our safety and and volunteer safety as well for sure. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then as far as following you guys on social media, um, do you guys still have the calendar where you're updating where you're traveling to? Yeah, yeah. So for 2021, as we touched on, we're still trying to figure out our schedule. Uh, once the schedule is updated and finalized, we typically put that on our uh, website calendar. And that's where it will be announced where we will be for how long. Um, if, you know, in this year of unknown, if we're accepting volunteers at this time. And so that can kind of just give you a glimpse into what our schedule is looking like in the year. Social media is a great platform to kind of just follow us with our kooky stories. Um, you know, you know, we have fun out here. Uh, there's always something fun and interesting happening. So definitely follow us on social media. Um, reach out to us again, Mike and Rachel. And um, we would love to get you out on the river, hopefully soon. Uh, and if the barge happens to be in your town or nearby, come out out and visit and at least get a glimpse of it in real life from the banks of the river. So 
follow us, ask us questions, follow up with us. We would love to connect with you all more. Awesome. And uh, Alice, they're located in East Moline, Illinois. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. That was so inspiring. And I'm getting a lot of good feedback in our chat, um, question and answer chat. So um, thank you guys so much and stay warm out there and uh, keep wrapping those trees. <laughs> thank you. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Take care. See you on the river soon. <laughs>